Amazing. Um, so I'm Jocelyn. I'm going to giving, be giving a presentation on trans feminine voice. I'm going to be talking about what it is, what's possible, um, uh, what's involved in it, and um, next steps in case you're interested in working with trans clients. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about my own experiences. I'm a trans woman. I've spent hundreds of hours listening to my own voice and trying to adjust it. I've also um, Oh, worked with a speech language pathologist and a couple of, um, of uh, voice coaches. Um, in this presentation, I'm also going to be giving an overview of the area as well as um, try to link to some resources in case you're interested in working with trans clients. Um, I'm going to start this presentation um, just by showing a clip from Zoe Alexandria, which, who I think really shows what's possible um, uh, in trans voice, she sings both parts of the song. Let me know if there's any issues with the audio, you can't hear it. Never know just what you've got till it's slipping through your fingers. Never know just what you've got till it's gone with the wind. And you never miss your shadow till there's no one left beside you. You never miss your shadow until you're alone, alone in the dark. So I think this clip and others like it, um, they were very impactful for me as I was getting started with trans voice. Um, and they're something that is really motivational for a lot of trans people. Um, but nothing she's doing is magic. The techniques she's using can be learned and they can be taught even if it's not easy. Um, Trans people work on their voice and other aspects of a gender presentation for survival, for safety, and just because it brings them joy. I don't really have time to go into the details of gender dysphoria and how it relates to trans people in this presentation, um, but I have a definition from WPATH here. Um, WPATH standards of care um, version eight is used across the world to determine the medical care that um, transgender people receive. Gender affirming care is the only form of care that um, uh, is shown to improve the quality of life for trans people. And I think that gender affirming care is a big part of the reason why I'm still around. Um, you do not need to be dysphoric in order to be transgender. Um, and um, in Ontario, the standards of care uh, do not, or in Ontario, it's not required to have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to see a speech language pathologist or to, for example, receive hormones. Um, if you're more interested in the definitions of gender dysphoria, I recommend either looking at the standards of care or um, taking a presentation from uh, Rainbow Health Ontario, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, if as a trans person, a trans feminine person, you do want to work on your voice, there is not a ton of options. And this is because um, the effects of testosterone puberty on the vocal, uh, vocal track are irreversible. Um, so bear with me. but. Even though I'm a little bit out of practice, my vocal tract hasn't changed and I still have access to like the same kind of sounds that I was able to make before I started practicing. Um, unlike for trans men where hormone therapy does, uh, does lower the voice, estrogen and other hormones do not have any effect on pitch or other aspects of, um, of the voice. And um, surgery alone is not sufficient to um, develop a feminine voice. Um, it's generally seen as a last resort in order to get, um, or if you are having um, surgery, you'll generally both need to have um, vocal training before and after surgery. Um, and um, surgery mainly only affects pitch, which is important, but it's only part of the aspects of a trans voice. Having said all that, I'm happy with my voice. Um, a lot of my friends have, uh, have beautiful voices. It's definitely something that, um, that is possible uh, just, by, just by training. So to understand, um, yeah, and, and, and so this is recognized in the literature. Um, uh, when talking about a trans feminine voice, um, uh, the standards of care recommend talking to trans people and working with trans people in order to teach trans voice. Uh, so I'm available. Lots of other trans people are very eager to help speech language pathologists um, uh, teach trans voice if they're interested. 
Um, having said that, and on that note, I'm going to go into various aspects which affect how a voice is gendered. Um, the most obvious, uh, most obvious um, aspect of how a voice is gendered is, of course, pitch. Men have a lower pitch than women, though there is a fair amount of overlap. If you have a group of, um, of people, it's not terribly unlikely that some woman in the group will have a lower pitch on average than, um, than some men. Uh, it is an important aspect of a way a voice is perceived, uh, but it's not, it, it's possible to have a low pitch and still be gendered um, as, as a woman. I think that this clip here really shows kind of the role that pitch has in how a voice is flavored, um, and I'm just gonna play it. You don't have to necessarily, uh, you know, accept each other's uh, opinions, but at least we can hear each other's out and see what the other one has to say. Do we really need to kill each other in order to uh, achieve our goals? And what kind of a goal is that? And what kind of a mother would ever teach such a thing? So that's the that's kind of uh, person that I had in mind, and I went for it. So Shari definitely has a very interesting voice, um, but it is distinctly feminine, and um, uh, she is not taken for it, or her voice is not taken for a man's. Um, and that's because of the other qualities of her voice. Because of the low pitch, her voice is very commanding. Um, she plays great leaders um, as an actor. Um, so if pitch is important, um, you know, and, and, and like most trans women will raise it a little bit to about 200 hertz, um, it's common for trans women when they're doing voice training to raise it too high um, to the point where it sounds unnatural or like Mickey Mouse, who does not sound feminine. Um, but it's like, um, it, it's not the only important aspect of a voice. So if pitch isn't uh, the only important aspect, what else matters? Um, one aspect of a voice that is really important, probably the most important for how a voice is perceived in terms of gender is resonance. Um, when you go through testosterone puberty, the vocal track, the size of the vocal track increases, and this has a um, meaningful impact on the sound beyond just the pitch. Um, when we're talking about increasing or decreasing the resonance, we're talking about increasing or decreasing the larynx height. Um, if you look at somebody's Adam's apple or Eve's apple um, and see it go up and down, that is affecting the larynx height. Um, when you're adjusting the larynx height for a given vowel, you also need to adjust the shape of your mouth to keep the same vowel. Um, and um, these terms here, vowel height and vowel depth, are used in the same way that they would be used if, for example, you're talking about the, or like in the context of like the IPA and vowel sounds. Um, the fact that resonance affects gender is intuitive. Um, if you ask men who have not, or in a study where they ask men um, who have not voice trained to imitate women, they raise their pitch, but they also adjust the resonance to be more feminine. So of course not enough to sound natural or else they would not be talking, but it is something that, um, that I think people realize is part of the sound of, um, um, that makes up a gender. Uh, one really interesting thing to me is that we adjust our resonances when we're speaking all of the time. We adjust it when we're trying to reach higher pitches um, as musicians, um, but also just when speaking, we change our, um, our learning site all the time. Um, the sound of the difference in, um, in the, like the first formant or the resonance of like an ah and an e sound are way more different than uh, the difference between ah and like a more masculine oh. Um, tried to jump out the same pitch there, but you get the idea. Um, and so it's definitely something that's possible to adjust. Um, there is a little bit of work required to uh, to access higher uh, resonances if you've gone through testosterone puberty, but really the hard part is just adjusting every single vowel. Um, and it takes a lot of practice. There's a lot of overlap between like resonance training in transgender women and like accent modification. And it's interesting to me that um, a lot of trans women who go through voice training uh, will, will, and who have a noticeable accent will have a different accent afterwards. If you're working with trans people, it's very important that you're able to hear the difference between resonance and pitch, um, and also important that you're able to adjust your own resonance. If you have gone through testosterone puberty, you have a bit of an advantage here just because you can match the sounds that your clients will make um, but either way, it's, uh, it's important to be able to adjust resonance. 
Another important aspect of voice is, or voice gender is weight. And this refers to the high frequencies of, um, of a voice. A, um, a voice that is more masculine or heavier or thicker will have more higher pitches. That might sound backwards, but a male voice has more higher pitches um, and it sounds shoutier. Um, weight is influenced a bit by, uh, by puberty, but it's also very cultural. Uh, a voice that, is, that has uh, more high frequencies and is heavier um, sounds more commanding, it sounds more aggressive. Um, one thing that's interesting to me is a voice that has um, a high weight sounds ruder with a high resonance than it does with a um, lower resonance. And weight for me, it's not, it wasn't very challenging to like get the weight I wanted for a given sound. What was really tricky for it was um, just figuring out the weight that works in every single social situation. Um, so that was, this to me was probably the hardest aspect of voice training. Um, like the weight that I use when talking to a partner would not be the same voice that I use when giving a lecture, for instance. Um, there are lots of other important aspects to the way a voice is gendered, intonation, stress, rhythm. They all play a big role. They are not related to physical changes. Um, so they're generally something that can be learned just by imitation or without like any special training. Um, if you think of like the voice of a stereotypical um, effeminate cis gay man, um, they're likely to have some of the aspects of, of a woman um, or typical woman, um, despite not having any training and those are the kind of aspects that apply there. Uh, trans women will learn these aspects of their voice. It doesn't necessarily need to be part of like lessons, though it can be if it's, um, if it's helpful. It's also important to talk a little bit about registers. It is difficult to talk at registers um, because everyone uses, uh, or everyone has different definitions to the same words and people use different words. Um, and also it's really hard to talk about the registers outside the context of weight and resonance. However, I'm going to try my best um, because I think it's really important. Um, an M1 voice in both males and females is often called a chest voice. Um, however, an M2 voice in females is called a head voice and an M2 voice in uh, males is called a, um, is called falsetto uh, often. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not using definitions that you like. There, people do use different, um, different words to mean the same thing here. Um, and they have different names because they have very different qualities. And this is true even after voice training. Um, no amount of training will fully make an M2 in a trans woman sound like an M2 in a non-trans woman. Um, M2 voices are, they have less weight and they have higher pitch. And so some speech language pathologists and other trainers uh, do try to use an M2 uh, voice in trans women, I, I think because of those facts. However, it very rarely sounds natural and um, it's likely that the client would need to start from scratch in order to learn how to speak naturally in an M1 voice. Um, when working with an M1 voice, you do change other qualities of the voice to make it a mixed voice. Um, a mixed voice is an M1 voice that um, where uh, if you do a pitch slide, the, um, the vocal break is less noticeable. Um, and so there are lots of things that affect that. Um, to work on a good mixed voice, uh, you can do a pitch slide and um, right where you have the voice break, try speaking right above that. Um, and that was really helpful to me. Um, other registers do have roles in a trans voice. Um, I love vocal fry, I use vocal fry a bunch. Um, some trans women also use falsetto for laughs or for singing or for, um, uh, or just to add flavor similarly to how you would add vocal fry to, to a voice. So it's not they have no role, it's just they should not be the primary mode of, um, mode of speaking. Um, so hopefully this is all very interesting. Uh, there's not a ton of research in trans feminine voice, um, but the WPAS standards of care do mention that there is research showing that it improves voice related quality of life. Um, uh, receiving care from professional uh, does increase the voice related quality of life and increases the amount of social interactions that um, trans people have. So working with trans clients 
does have a really big impact. Um, there's not a lot of qualified people working with trans clients. Uh, trans voice trainers, not SLPs, will often charge two or three hundred dollars an hour and still have long backlogs. Um, and of course, that's not covered by insurance. And also working on the aspects I've mentioned, of course, brings up other issues um, uh, such as tightness, which can be addressed by a speech language pathologist, of course. Um, so it's uh, I, I think there is a there is a really important role for more speech language pathologists um, in in um, in voice care or in trans transgender voice care. Um, if you do want to work with trans clients, I do recommend taking some kind of clinical and cultural competency course that will go over the um, definition of gender dysphoria and like how to interact with uh, trans uh, trans clients. There's two really important reasons for this. The biggest reason for me, honestly, is that it's um, that when we're working with service providers who haven't gone through this kind of training, they often feel like they have to walk on eggshells um, and don't know what's okay to bring up and what's not, or like. Um, and it just makes the interaction uh, kind of awkward. Um, and of course, you know, when you are working with trans clients, they're making themselves very vulnerable. And so it's important to, um, important to have some amount of training. These are like um, several hour trainings. They're not, um, it's not a huge demand. I would highly recommend it something, or something like it. Um, there are also tons of resources from trans women who have worked on their voice. Trans Voice Lessons and Seattle Voice Lab are both fantastic resources. Uh, if you're interested in the academic side um, or the, um, the standards of care, uh, WFAS standards of care is a great read, um, particularly chapter 14, which is voice and communication, and they will cite much of the research in this area. Um, and there's, a, again, a link to Rainbow Health Ontario. Uh, if you are interested in uh, getting involved in, in this space for working with trans clients and you think I could help, please reach out to me. I, um, this is something that's very important to me. I think there's a lot of barriers uh, that people like me have to access, um, access um, this kind of care. Um, that is all I have. Uh, you can definitely email me questions. If we have uh, time right now, I'm happy to answer questions about just about anything as well.